Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Outlaws of Guns and with the host Bang and Dang. Back once again for the most historically accurate and serious true crime podcast out that there. out there, man. In the lands really of America making waves. and the world today. With that, we are uh, fresh off of OJ and fresh, fresh off of the San Ysidro uh, McDonald's massacre last week. And we ain't stopping there because today we got another uh, uh, massacre slash tragedy slash um, lots of well, lots of kids getting killed in this one. Um, if you ever are, you already noticed by the title, the Bath School Massacre mm. probably and is the first school mm. massacre in the history of the United States. Is it the first one? It's the first ever school massacre in the United States. Well, there have been others. Like I believe in the 1800s, a uh, tribe of Indians broke into a schoolhouse and like slaughtered all the kids and the teacher. So it's not the first one. Then. Well, that was in modern history, I should say. Then that was part of the Indian Wars and shit. So can you really uh, savages barely even human? <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, yeah, um, the Bass City or Bass School Massacre, which. Kind of, I mean, I can't say it hits home because we were not even uh, mm. even thought of when this happened in 1922, when? but, um, no. or 27. No. Well, well maybe we're thought of by a great grandmother. Right, 1927. Um, we're probably thought of. But it does kind of hit home in the sense of it's literally only about 60 miles from where we live at the moment <laughs> in Michigan. So kind of extra interest in this for the landscape that it involves in for us personally but i'm sure you guys have all heard of the bath school massacre a series of violent attacks perpetrated by andrew kehoe on may 18th 1927 in bath township attacks killed 38 elementary school children Dang. and six adults Damn. and injured at least 50 other 58 other people Shit. prior to his timed explosives detonated at the bath consolidated school building kehoe had murdered his wife Nellie Price Kehoe and firebombed his farm. Jeez. Arriving at the site of the school explosion, he died when he detonated explosives concealed in his truck. Wow, this guy is just a prick. He's uh, going to kill himself anyway, but he had to take... What Bath, are they thinking? Well, what are they they're, thinking? They're all idiots. Bath Township is a civil township located 10 miles northeast of Lansing. Everybody knows Lansing, right? You should. Right. Uh, state capital of Michigan. Township covers 31 square miles, and the small unincorporated village of Bath is within its borders. So we've got the village and the township. Huh? All right. The township itself is within Clinton County, Michigan, an area of some 566 square miles. Early 1920s, the area was primarily agricultural, yeah, which a, it yeah. primarily is still. After years of debate, the Bath Township voters approved the creation of the Bath Consolidated School District in 1922, along with an increase in township property taxes to pay for a new school. Oh, that's that's well, an important uh, detail well, right I, there. What was that there? They increased the township property taxes to pay for it. Oh, okay. 1922. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. When the school opened, it had 236 students enrolled in grades 1 through 12. All landowners within the township area had to pay a higher ad valorem property tax. Gets so divided. The tax gets divided whose amount is based off the value of a transaction or of a property. So if your property was higher, you're paying higher taxes. So according to value is what you paid your taxes on. Right. They didn't have a set tax. Oh, that sucks. So if you had a, a oh, big no. expensive farm and shit, you're paying more property taxes than the little guy. Well, Which, I mean, whatever. Yeah. At the time of the bombing, the unincorporated village had only about 300 adult residents. Okay. And unfortunately, we got to tell you about the piece of shit that, uh, yeah. the, that perpetrated it. This guy. This guy. Anybody named Andrew. You got to watch out right. for it. Douchebags. Dude. Right. Andrew Philip Kehoe was born in Tecumseh, Michigan, February 1st, 1872. Family of 13 children attended the high school. All of them did, right? Local. After graduating, Kehoe studied electrical engineering at Michigan State. Well. Which is in East Lansing, if nobody knows that. Now we know uh, how yeah, he wired it. up bombs and yeah. shit. Well. Plus any Michigan State guy. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, you can't trust those Michigan Staters. Nope. Larry Nasser. And then he moved to St. Louis, which makes it even worse. Right. Where he worked as an electrician for several years. At some point during this period, he suffered a head injury oh. in a fall. Was semi-conscious or in a coma for a period of several weeks. Oh. oh how could you be semi-conscious or in a coma? Well, he, might, he moved to St. Louis, um, Missouri, not St. Louis, Michigan. Right. Right. 
It might be St. Louis, Michigan. It's not. He later returned to Michigan. Right, 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 right. right. He later returned to Michigan to his father's farm. Well, then his mom died. It always with a head injury. There goes with the head injury, man. So is that that right there instantly trying to make him maybe some Uh, some kind uh, of a... uh, um, Excuse. Right. Some kind of a compassion right there. No, "No." there's no compassion. Uh, Then his mother dies, and his father, Philip, married a much younger widow named Frances Wilder, and a daughter was born. September 17, 1911, as his stepmother attempted to light the family's oil stove, it exploded and set her on fire. What? Kehoe threw a bucket of water on her, but the fire was oil-based, and his action spread the flames more rapidly. You never throw water on an oil fire, man. man. She engulfed and emulated her body, dude. Injuries were fatal, and she died the next day. Obviously. Some of Kehoe's later neighbors in Bath believed that he had caused a stove explosion. Oh, wait a minute here. Right. Do you think he, like, rigged it for when she was lighting it? He had to. Boom. How old have we been here? When was he born? 1872, so he's 30 years old by now. 82, 92, 02. It's almost 40 years old right here. All, all day then. Right. I can't believe that. Yeah. You didn't like her? Apparently. Wow. This was in 1911. Okay. Kehoe married Ellen Nelly Price in 1912, age of 40. Age of 40. Late bloomer, huh? Seven years later, they moved to a farmhouse outside Bath. Mm. Kehoe was said to be dependable, doing favors and volunteer work for his neighbors. He was also described as being notoriously impatient with any disagreement. All right. Anything that he don't, he's just, boom. He had Listen sh- here, you cocksucker, right? Right. He shot and killed a neighbor's dog that come onto his property and annoyed him by barking. <laughs> hey, it's his right. This is 1922 or it's, 1912, man. This is right. As long as he at least warned the neighbors before. Keep your damn dog off my right. property. I'm going to shoot him. I bet that's what he did. Well, however, this next part's pretty fricked. Well, he also beaten one of his horses. To- what? Man. Beaten one of his horses to death when it was, did not perform to this prick. Yeah, he was this like, horse did not perform to his expectations, he so he like, you beat don't perform the horse. to my expectation. How the hell do you beat a horse to death? Must have took something and knocked it over the head or something, right? Jeez, oh, didn't beats. do it with his fists. We know that. Oh. Kehoe had a reputation for frugality and was elected in 1924 as a trustee on the school board for three years and treasurer for one. He argued strongly for lower taxes and later superintendent of the board, M. W. Keys, said that he fought the expenditure of money for the most necessary equipment. That's a quote unquote. Right. Kehoe was considered difficult to work with, often voted against the rest of the board. You have to have a unanimous decision, too, right. so wanted his own way and arguing with the township financial authorities. He protested that he paid too much in taxes, tried to get the valuation of his property reduced so he would pay less. Oh, he's just pissed because, yeah. He's got a good property. That's what he should be proud of it. Then. All right. 1922, the Bath Township school tax was $12.26 for every $1,000 valuation of a property. Mm. Wow. With the valuation of Kehoe's farm being ten thousand dollars, equivalent to one hundred sixty-one thousand in twenty twenty-one. That's it. All right. So I guess his farm wasn't all that. What? Right. <laughs> so he's paying what twelve? <laughs> he's paying one hundred and twenty some dollars in taxes. I mean, I guess that's a lot back then. One hundred and twenty-two, one hundred and twenty bucks per for taxes, <laughs> which he'd be paying a thousand, twelve hundred. Right. He'd be paying twelve hundred bucks in taxes, just like we do every year. Right. So nothing. In two, right. Right. 1923, the school board raised the tax to 1880 per $1,000 evaluation. And in 26, Whoa. Yeah, that's a lot. And in 26, the taxes went up to 1980. Whoa. This meant that Keogh's tax liability went from 122.60 in 1922. Okay, so that was equivalent to, to 1985 in today's money, which uh, was his old, that was the old tax. Right, and it jumped up to 198, which is uh, 3,000. Yeah, that's a, I would be pretty pissed off myself. 1926, Kehoe was notified that the widow of his wife's uncle, who held the mortgage on his property, had begun foreclosure proceedings. Oh. Sheriff Fox, who had served the foreclosure notice, reported that Kehoe had muttered, if it hadn't been for that $300 school tax, I might have paid off this mortgage. So what? Everybody would have said that. Right. Mr. Price, the mortgage holder, also reported that Kehoe had stated, if I can't live in that house, no one else will. That's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now then I see something there. But wow. still, you don't think he's going to take out a whole damn school? He just said, no, I'll burn my house down, basically. Right. Is what he's saying, you know. 
Right. He's right. Name of school. <laughs> <laughs> right. Keogh was appointed in 1925 to temporarily fill the position of town clerk. What? There's, Nobody liked the guy, right. but he's going to be town clerk. But he was defeated in the April 1926 <laughs> election. Yeah, really? that's probably why. Oh, that probably made him more pissed. Probably. This, well, this, republic, this public rejection by the community angered him. Uh, Ellsworth wrote that he thought that this defeat was the reason why Keogh had planned his murderous revenge. I think it is. Using the bombings to destroy the school and kill the community's children and many of its members. Oh, wow. In the book Bath Massacre, Arnie Bernstein, or Bernstein cites Robert D. Harris' psychopathy checklist and says that Andrew Kehoe fits the profile all too well. I'm sure he does. Carnegie Mellon University's Dr. Marion, Mary Ellen O'Toole, head of CMU's <laughs> Department of Forensic Science. You're such an old tool. <laughs> oh, you old tool. Has stated that Kehoe could have could be described as an injustice, injustice collector, quote unquote. Quote, unquote. A phrase meaning someone who obsessively collects perceived slights along with their personal misfortunes. I get it. Latching onto those feelings of persecution until the indiv- individual feels forced to lash out. Isn't this... Well, I pretty much had the same thing last episode where this dude was taking notes of people that, like, wronged him. It's not just last episode. It seems to be all these the, episodes the, that contain some massacres, douchebag. Right. Yeah. Uh, Howard Unruh, he... Yeah. Took note of everybody that said some sly shit to him in the streets, and yeah, dude, hmm. that's mental shit. Right? That's a common connection we're making here, guys. See, right. see, we we ain't just messing around. We're actually making uh, some leeways. Maybe we'll publish a paper one day. Right. <laughs> Maybe they need to go back to the Wild West era because when anybody had a problem, then they just took it, you know, right there. He didn't he didn't harbor it forever, and right. he was like, I'm gonna take it out on all these people, and still have a grudge because you didn't get the person you want. Right. Keo's neighbor A. McMullen. Noted that Keogh had stopped working on his farm altogether for most of the preceding year. Oh. He has speculated that Keogh might be planning suicide. Keogh had given him one of his horses in April in 1927. But McMullen returned it for this reason. So he returned it because he thought he was going to commit suicide? It was discovered later that Keogh had cut all his wire fences as part of his preparation to destroy his farm. At least he was trying to get rid of the horse so he wouldn't burn up, right? We didn't care about the people in the right. house. Girly and young shade trees to kill them off, cutting his grapevine plants before putting them back on their stumps to hide the damage. Oh, so he was already just destroying everything, right. dude. Getting it ready. Wow, well, he had great plans, so good for him, huh? I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sticking to a plan. I mean, yeah, right. gotta let guys stick schedule. <laughs> he gathered lumber and other materials and put them in the tool shed, which he later destroyed with an incendiary bomb. Okay. By the time of the bombing, Nellie Kehoe had become chronically ill with what resembled tuberculosis. Oh, Uh-oh. geez, that's even worse. For which, right, for which there was no effective <sighs> treatment or cure at the time. Yeah. The frequent hospital stays may have contributed to the family's debt. You think? Yeah. Kehoe had seized making mortgage and homeowners insurance payments months earlier. Really? That's setting it all off here, huh? Hmm. There's no clear indication of when Kehoe conceived the idea of massacring the school children and the townspeople. But Ellsworth, who was a neighbor, thought that Kehoe conceived his plan after being defeated on the 5th of April in 1926. You know, when he didn't win that township clerk re-election election um well he was he was appointed. appointed yeah i think that changed everything for that poor man you could just see it in his face he's like screw you that was might have been his last chance to get uh and then his wife dying of tuberculosis and well, now he has got to pay she, more she tax didn't, she didn't die of tuberculosis she died of fire <laughs> <laughs> she died of murder um <laughs> that was his, right. that was his last chance to maybe get the taxes lowered he thought probably in the to be a township clerk All right his last chance that people would listen to him. He, so, when yeah. he put that all together, he hit his head. His wife's dying of tuberculosis. Taxes are Taxes killing went him. up. The consensus of the townspeople was that he had worked on his plan since at least the previous August. So, jeez. Mm, okay. Bass School Board member M.W. Keyes was quoted by the New York Times. I have no doubt that he made his plans last fall to blow up this school. He was an experienced electrician, and the board employed him in November to make some repairs on the school lighting system. Mm, <laughs> mm, mm. He had ample opportunity then to plant the explosives and lay the wires for touching it off. It's true. Yes. <laughs> yes. Just, well, that's exactly what he did. Yes. <laughs> Kehoe had free access to the school building during the summer vacation of 1926, wow. in and out as he pleased. From mid-1926, he began buying more than a ton of pyrotol which is an incendiary explosive used by farmers during their era for excavation and burning debris. All right. So he had an excuse to buy it. I'm a, fa- mm, I'm a farmer. I'm a farmer. <laughs> in November 1926, he drove to Lansing and bought two boxes of dynamite at a sporting goods store. Nice. Back in the day when, you know, you could just stra- uh, casually stroll in and buy dynamite. 
Dynamite was also commonly used on farms, so his purchase of small amounts of explosives at different stores and on different dates did not raise any suspicions. You, you imagine if they sold them in, in convenience stores. <laughs> like, uh, I'll take the six pack here, give me a pack of. Give me a 12 pack of dynamite. <laughs> 12 pack of dynamite. And uh, no, you say that last. Like, give me a pack of cigarettes, give me this. You grab a la- laffy taffy and put it on there. You just look around and be like, 12 pack of dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Give me the one on the bottom, Chuck. Right. No, 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 not that one. <laughs> no, I know what you motherfuckers do. Put the ones in front. Give me the one all the way in the back. <laughs> Neighbors reported hearing an explosion set off oh. on the farm with one calling him the dynamite farmer. Uh oh. But they didn't uh, uh, go there and investigate what the hell he was doing. Do you need permits? Following disaster is reported that Michigan State Police. Following disaster is reported that Michigan State Police had discovered that a considerable amount of dynamite had been stolen from a bridge construction site. And that Andrew Kehoe was suspected of that theft. Why would they suspect him of it? Investigators also well, this, reco- is, this is after the disaster, so now right. they're like, oh, oh, oh he probably right. stole it. Right. Investigators also recovered a container of gasoline in the school's basement. The container was rigged. Oh. <laughs> the container was rigged with a tube, and investigators speculated that Kehoe had planned that the gasoline fumes would ignite from a spark scattering burning gas. Yeah. From a spark. Yeah, like the, the furnace or anything like that, right? Uh, in the undamaged section of the school, it was found that Kehoe had concealed the explosives in six lengths of eaves trough pipe, oh. three bamboo fishing rods, and what were described as windmill rods that were placed in the basement ceiling. Ooh. Kehoe purchased a 30 caliber Winchester boat action rifle in December of 1926, according to the testimony of Lieutenant Lyle Morse, who was a Michigan State Police investigator with the Department of Public Safety. Mm. Okay, so now he's got a gun. All right, prior to 18th May. Kehoe had loaded the back seat of his truck with metal debris capable of producing shrapnel during an explosion. He also bought a new set of tires for his truck to avoid breaking down when transporting the explosives. How do you know? <laughs> uh, it's like, <laughs> his radiator and shit's uh, smoking. <laughs> his engine's smoking. He's like, you know what? New set of tires he, should do it. <laughs> he goes to the tire place. Hey, uh, give me the best tires to transport explosives. <laughs> Or, or it's like back in the day when they recommended like heroin and shit for uh, ailments. <laughs> like they were so stupid back then. Uh, on engine smoking, he was. They're like new set of tires should do it. <laughs> <laughs> new set of tires should take care of that that smoky engine right away. <laughs> stupid. And then you get down the road after new set of tires, you're like, damn. <laughs> um, Tell you what, it might be those damn wiper blades. <laughs> Everybody that wants a serious podcast right now is is <laughs> cursing us out, and they just the, they probably just out. threw their phone across the back room. At? We're <laughs> uh, set of tires. Set of t- what a, that's the stupidest <laughs> thing I've ever seen. Right. He made many trips to Lansing for more explosives, as well as to the school, the town, and to his house. So that's why he wanted new tires, I guess. Ida Hall, who lived in a house next to the school, saw activity around the building on different nights during May. Early one morning after midnight, she saw a man carrying objects inside. She also saw vehicles around the building several times late at night. Vehicles? Hall mentioned these events to a relative, but they were never reported to the police. Well, Hall, you're an idiot. Mm-hmm. Nellie was discharged from Lansing's St. And relative's an idiot, too. Right, right. Nellie was discharged from Lansing St. Lawrence Hospital on May 16th. Um, and was murdered by her husband sometime between her release and the bombings, which took place two days later. Dang. Kehoe put her body in a wheelbarrow at the rear of the farm's chicken coop, where it was found in a heavily charred condition after the farm explosions and fire. Crazy. Piled around the cart were silverware and a metal cash box. The ashes of several banknotes could be seen through a slit in the cash box. Hmm. Oh, so did he think? Did he think that the banknotes would survive because it was in a metal box? I don't know. Maybe. Didn't take into account their slots in it. <laughs> Why would he care, though? It's for relatives Him? or something? I don't know. The barrier? I don't know. I don't think so. Keith, why would he put it there, though? And silverware? Why did he do anything? I think he'd put them there because he thought somebody would benefit from the silverware. He could sell it, and then he'd cash. Anyways, Keo placed and wired homemade pyrotol firebombs in the house and throughout the farm buildings. The only thing that stands of his house... After that was the chimney. Approximately 845, Wednesday, May 18th, Kehoe detonated the fire bombs in his house and farm buildings, causing some debris to fly into a neighbor's poultry brooding house. Oh, jeez. Damn chickens. Neighbors noticed the fire and volunteers rushed to the scene. Mm. O.H. Bush and several other men crawled through a broken window of the farmhouse in search of survivors. 
when they found no one was in the house, they salvaged what they what furniture they could. What a bunch of helpful neighbors, right? right. They were like, um, Kehoe's not home. Right. Uh, he don't know his house is burning. I'm going to salvage some of his shit for him. That's badass. Right. Nice. But, yeah, they salvaged as much furniture as they could before the fire spread into the living room. Bush discovered dynamite in the corner. Oh, shit. He picked up an armful of explosives and handed it to one of the men. Kehoe left the burning property in his Ford truck. He stopped to tell those fighting the fire that they should get to the school and then drove off. Wow. Hmm. What a dick. So he's like, uh, this ain't the only fire you're about to fight here, <laughs> but like, For you, I will not worry about that shit. Yeah, don't worry about that one. Uh, classes at Bath Consolidated School began at 8.30 a.m. Kehoe had set an alarm clock in the basement of the north wing of the school, which detonated the dynamite and pyrotol he had hidden there at about 4, 8.45 a.m., right when he was burning his house down. Oh, jeez. Rescuers heading to the scene of the Kehoe Farm fire heard the explosion at the school building, then turned back in that direction. Parents within the rural community rushed to the school. Everybody could see oh, it. It's only a little 300-person town, dude. Yeah. The school building resembled, resembled a war zone with 38 people killed in the initial explosion, mostly children. Jeez. That's just terrible. Wow. Witnesses and survivors were interviewed afterwards by newspaper reporters. First grade teacher Bernice Sterling told Associated Press that the explosion was like an earthquake. The air seemed to be full of children and flying desks and books. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. Children were tossed high in the air. And some were cat- catapulted out of the building. Damn. Eyewitness Robert Gates said the scene was pure chaos. Mother after mother came running into the schoolyard, demanding information about their child. Seeing the lifeless form lying on the lawn, sobbed and swooned. In no time, more than 100 men were at work, tearing away the debris, and nearly as many women were frantically pawing over their timber and broken bricks for traces of their children. Jeez, dude, imagine wow. that sight. I don't want I don't to. want to either. <laughs> one said, I saw more than one woman lift clusters of bricks held together by mortar heavier than the average man could have handled without a crowbar. Um, Ellsworth recounted, I saw one mother, Miss Eugene Hart, sitting on the bank for a short distance from a short distance from the school with a little dead girl on each side of her and holding a little boy. Jeez. Jeez. Percy, who died a short time after they got him to the hospital. Oh, a little boy it was named Percy, who died a short time after they got him to the hospital. This is about the time Keo blew his car up in the street, severely wounding Perry, the oldest child of Mr. and Mrs. Hart. Jeez, Jeez dude. Pete. He's sitting at the, he's sitting there in in his car watching this shit. And then he blew up his own. Yep. Wow. We haven't even got to the car blow up part yet, but this is just a quote from somebody. Right. The north wing of the school had collapsed, leaving the edge of the roof on the ground. Ellsworth recalled that there was a pile of children, about five or six, under the roof. Jeez. He volunteered to drive back to his farm and get a rope heavy enough to pull the school roof off the children's bodies. That's. I mean, what else are you going to do? Do a lot of damage, I guess. Returning to his farm, he saw Kehoe driving in the opposite direction, so Kehoe's not even at the school yet, oh. heading towards the school. He grinned and waved his hand. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, man. Ellsworth said when he grinned, I could see both rows of his teeth. That's how hard he was smiling. You bastard, dude. Wow, oh, dude. Kehoe drove up to the school about half an hour after the first explosion. He saw Superintendent Hook and summoned him over to his truck. He's like, hey, what's going what on happened? here, man? Charles Hawson testified at the inquest that he saw the two men grapple over some type of long gun, he said, before Kehoe detonated dynamite stored in his truck, immediately killing himself and Hook. Nelson McFerrin, a retired farmer, and Cleo Clayton, an eight-year-old second grader. Oh, jeez. Clayton had survived the first blast and then wandered out of the school building. He was killed by fragmentation from the exploding vehicle. Wow. Oh, Cleo thought he was safe, huh? All right. The truck explosion spread debris over a large area and caused extensive damage to cars parked half a block away Jeez. with the roofs catching on fire from the burning gas. It injured several others and mortally wounded Postmaster Glenn O. Smith, who lost oh, a leg and no. died before making it to a hospital. Not Postmaster. O.H. Bush recalled that one of his crew bound up the quote-unquote wounds of Glenn Smith, the Postmaster. His leg had been blown off. Oh, no. Telephone operators stayed at their stations for hours to summon doctors, undertakers, air hospital workers, and anyone else who might help. The Lansing Fire Department sent several firefighters and its chief. You know what? We're going to send you, chief. I think it's a time for him to go, right? Right. I think, yeah, this is uh, <laughs> something the chief of a fire department right. would want to be a part of. Local physician J.A. Crum and his wife, a nurse, who had both served in World War One, turned their bath drugstore into a triage center. Or triage. Right. 
The dead bodies were taken to the town hall, which was used as a morgue. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Hundreds of people worked in the wreckage all day and into the night in an effort to find and rescue any children pinned underneath. Wow. Area contractors sent all their men to assist, and many other people came to the scene in response to pleas for help. Eventually, 34 firefighters and the chief of the Lansing Fire Department arrived, as did several Michigan State police officers who managed traffic to and from the scene. To and from. The injured and dying were transported to Sparrow Hospital, which still stands today in uh, Lansing. Sparrow? Yeah. yeah. And St. Lawrence Hospital in Lansing. The construction of the St. Lawrence facility had been financed in large part by Lawrence Price, who was Nellie Kehoe's uncle. Oh, jeez. And formerly an executive in charge of Oldsmobile's Lansing Car what? Assembly. Ain't that ironic? Ain't that a Don't bitch. Don't you think? Uh, Michigan Governor Fred W. Green arrived during the afternoon of the disaster and assisted in the relief work. Okay. Carting bricks away from the scene. Nice. Hell yeah, Governor. Hell of a PR stunt for you, huh, Green? Right. Lawrence, How long did he do that for, though? Right. It's like three bricks. Maybe. The, the Lawrence Bacon Company of Lanson sent a truck filled with pies and sandwiches, which were served to rescuers in the township's community hall. They were probably foam bricks. <laughs> Set of pile of foam bricks over here so when mayor gets here. During the search for survivors and victims, rescuers found an additional 500 pounds of dynamite, which had failed to detonate Damn. south wing of the school. Search yeah, was, that south right? wing. Ironically, though, I bet that south wing is the one where all the older students are. I bet. Well, either way. Well, still, but. You had a bunch of little seven, six, seven, and eight-year-olds yeah, instead of the, got the damage done. That's well, I think they, he meant for all of them anyway. So. Tug, tugs on the heartstring a little bit more, doesn't it? Either way, seven or 12. Or 18. This was a school that had first through 12th graders. Right. So you had 18-year-olds on the probably the wing that the dynamite didn't even go off. Right. I'm not saying it would have been. <laughs> I'm not saying it would have been better for those guys to take it, but I mean, like I said... Makes the story a little bit more uh, heart wrenching when it's uh, seven and eight year olds, you know. The search was halted to allow the Michigan State Police to disarm the devices. They found an alarm clock timed to go off at eight forty five a.m. So Ooh, it meant they were like, "Well, it didn't go off." Time. Investigators speculated that the initial explosion may have caused a short circuit in the second set of bombs, most likely preventing the bombs from detonating. They searched the building and then returned to the recovery work. Police and fire officials gathered at the Kehoe Farm to investigate the fires. That's the shitty part, because they need everybody you can at that school right now. And they have to have people at this house right now, too. So you're taking away. Right. Taking away helpful hands to go to a what? A burning house with nobody's in? Well, nobody's in. No. <laughs> Somebody's around. <sighs> State troopers had searched for Nellie Keogh throughout Michigan, thinking that she was at a tuberculosis sanatorium. Oh, she was. But her charred remains were found the day after the disaster among the ruins of the farm. Sad. All the Keyhole farm buildings were destroyed. Keyhole's two horses had burned to death, trapped oh, inside geez. the barn. Because the idiot brought them right. back. Their carcasses were found with their legs hobbled together with what? No, oh, he... Okay. Whoa. What? He prevented them from even running. Oh, this guy's sick. Hobbled together with wire, prevented their escape or rescue when the farm's buildings blew up and caught fire. Oh, no. What a dick. <sighs> investigators found a wooden sign wired to the farm's fence with Keyhole's last message stenciled on it. said, criminals are made, not born. Hmm. I don't know about that. Mm. Mm. American Red Cross. That is, the criminals aren't born. <laughs> you know, you're not born to be wired as a criminal. Yeah. 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 Some people are. Well, no. American Red Cross set up operations center at the Crumb Drug Store. Took the lead in providing aid and comfort to the victims. Lansing Red Cross headquarters stayed open until 1130 that night to answer telephone calls. That's it? Update the list of dead and injured and to provide information and planning services for the following day. The local community responded generously. As reported at the time by the Associated Press, a sympathetic public assured the rehabilitation of the stricken community. Well, good. Well, I mean, yeah, they're a tight-knit community right. probably already. Right, and bath strong. <laughs> Aid was tendered freely in the hope that the grief of those who lost loved ones might even slightly mitigated. I mean, I guess, but the Red Cross managed donations sent to pay for both the medical expenses of the survivors and the burial costs of the dead. In, the few, in a few weeks... $5,284.15, which is equivalent to $82,431. Damn. I don't know why I said eight, like that. $82,431 <laughs> in 2021 was raised through donations, including 2500 from the Clinton County Board of Supervisors. Dang. 2000 from the Michigan Legislature. Mm. That's all you can muster up, politicians. Right. The disaster received nationwide coverage in the days following. I'm sure it did. Sharing headlines with Charles Limbaugh's. Oh, Oh, sharing headlines with Charles Lindbergh's transatlantic crossing. Uh-oh. 
obviously, though, Lindbergh's crossing received much more attention. Clearly. But still, when you're sharing headlines with something important like that, you know that's big. <clears throat> and eliciting a national outpouring of grief. Newspaper headlines from across the United States characterized Kehoe as a maniac, a madman, and a fiend. Oh, no. People from across the world expressed sympathy to the families in the community of Bath, including letters from some Italian school children. One fifth grade class wrote, even if we are small, we understand all sorrow and misfortune that has struck our dear brothers. Oh, I'll take things not written by a fifth grader for 500, Alex. Right. Another Italian class wrote, we are praying to, to the whole class wrote this. Oh, apparently one collective message. Right. We are praying to God. Give to the unfortunate mothers and fathers of Bath Township. They didn't say that. <laughs> the strength to bear the great sorrow that has descent on them. We are near to you in spirit. Hmm. Good well, for them. Good for those guys. I'll take another quote. Not, not, not said right. by uh, right. Right. the teacher wrote that. But hey, what are you going to do? It's the, this gesture that counts. Right. Kehoe's body was claimed by one of his sisters and his body was buried in an unmarked grave. Good. At the pulper section of Mount Rest Cemetery in St. John's, Michigan. It's a unmarked, unmarked, popper. unmarked in the poor section of the cemetery, right. pretty much, right? right? Price family buried Nellie Price Keyhole in a Lansing Cemetery under her maiden name. Damn right they did. Mm-hmm. Her dad probably didn't even like him anyway. Mm-mm. Vehicles from outlying areas and surrounding states descended upon Bath by the thousands. Good. Over 100,000 vehicles passed through on Saturday alone, an enormous amount of traffic for that area. Yeah, we looked up the map. It's three roads long. Right. Yeah, and they wanted, they just wanted to see the debris. And they'd be like, oh, my gosh. Right. Could you imagine these poor people? Well, That's what the people wanted. It's, people are sick. Yeah. People are sick. I just want to see it. I just want to see it and go, oh, dear. I can't believe it. And go back home. Like, you couldn't imagine that war zone I've seen. Right. Get out of here. Fucking bandwagoners. Some bad citizens regarded this as an unwarranted intrusion into their time of grief. Yeah, you think? Ah, yeah. But most accepted it as a show of sympathy and support from surrounding communities. It's a lie. It's not. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's a lie. Right. Burials of individual victims started that Friday, two days after the disaster. Funerals and burials continued on Saturday and Sunday until all the dead were buried. For a time, that, that sounds like the last story. We had them in had the, to do it as quick as possible to get all the bodies in the yeah. arena or whatever. Jeez. For a time following the tragedy, the town and Kehoe's burned out farm continued to attract curiosity seekers. Damn, sure did. Coroner arrived at the scene on the day of the disaster and swore in six community leaders that afternoon to serve as a jury investigating the death of Super, Superintendent Hike. You're welcome, guys. I, I pronounced it right instead of uh, dang over here. So if, we wanna, if, if I want to hear any mispronunciations of words, it's dang's fault. And I, might. I said it was Hike. And formal testimony had been taken on May 19th, and the formal testimony had been taken on May 19th, and the formal coroner's inquest, coroner's inquest started on May 23rd. Okay. Clinton County prosecutor conducted the examination, and more than 50 people testified before the jury. Oh. During his testimony, David Hart stated that Kehoe had told him that he had, quote-unquote, killed a horse. And the New York Times reported people as saying that uh, Kehoe had an ungovernable temper. So tell me that... Uh Kehoe just was like, hey, man. Like, hey, what's going on, Andrew? How are you going? What's going on, Mr. Kehoe? I killed a horse. <laughs> <laughs> I already probably said I, I had to kill him or don't tell me he was stupid or something. Maybe that's all he said as he walked by and he tipped his head. <laughs> killed a horse. Killed a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and, and apparently he seemed to have a mania for killing things. Well, he killed one thing. Well, <laughs> before, the, before the bombing. Never testified that he'd been wiring the buildings at his farm about... That time and that he was uh, evasive about his reasons. He had been what? They knew he was wiring his. Uh, he was wiring his building. Wiring it up for explosions. He knew they knew they were. He was wiring it, but uh, they're just like, oh, that's normal, right? Idiots. Kehoe's neighbor Sidney J. Howe testified that after the fire began at the Kehoe farm, Kehoe warned him and three men to leave. He said, "Boys, you are my friends. You better go out of here." You better go down to that school. Three telephone linemen working near Bath testified that Kehoe passed them in his truck on the road towards the school. They saw him arrive there. His truck swerved and stopped in front of the building. In the next instant, according to the linemen, the truck blew up. One of them was struck by shrapnel. Mm -hmm. So they were still up in the. Right. They were still up in the. Or they were just chilling there after the school had bombed. No, Thirty geez, minutes earlier, sitting there. What were they doing? Watching it. Other witnesses testified that Kehoe paused after stopping, calling Hike 
over to the truck and that the two men struggled before Kehoe's truck was blown Yeah, because he wanted to blow uh, that guy. Hike's head yeah, off he with wanted, the gun and then yeah, blow himself right, up. Right, And so I guess he got... Well, I got his wish, I guess. Well, Although there was never any doubt that Kehoe was the perpetrator, the jury was asked to determine if the school board or its employees were guilty of criminal negligence. After more than a week of testimony, the jury exonerated the school board and its employees, of course. In its verdict, the jury concluded that Kehoe conducted himself sanely and so concealed as... Yeah, because they're trying to blame them for putting him on the school board right. and all that, or not right. hiring them, hiring right. him to do the work. Right. Ah, uh, okay. You gotta investigate, right? Right. <clears throat> they concluded that he conducted himself sanely and so concealed his operations that there was no cause to suspect of any of his actions. We further find that the school board and Frank Smith, who was janitor of the building, mm. were not negligent in and about their duties and were not guilty of any negligence in not discovering Kehoe's plan. <clears throat> so they were trying to put it on the janitor, too. Why didn't well, you Why didn't you find all these explosives in the basement, janitor? I, 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 how do you not? Right. You're the janitor, right. janitor. Are you, are you not janitoring? Right. <laughs> I mean, not, come you, on. You're not, <laughs> you're not <laughs> janitoring you're not the school. Janitoring. Like, what the hell we hire you that for? That means the basement too, bud. Right. He like, does. He's like, I, I mean, it does, right? He's like, I scared the basement. <laughs> right. No one told me I had to go into the b- b- basement. <laughs> the inquest determined that Keyhole murdered Superintendent Emery Hike on the morning of the 18th of May. Well, no shit. All right. It was also the jury's verdict that the school was blown up as part of the plan and that Keyhole alone, without the aid of conspirators, murdered 43 people in total, including his wife, Nellie. Suicide was determined to be the cause of Keo's death. Oh, no shit. Which brought the total number of dead, 44. Yeah, we don't count the killers. Right, right, ever. No, never. On August 22nd, three months after the bombing, fourth grader Beatrice Gibbs died following hip surgery. Hers was the 45th oh, and final geez. death directly attributed to the Bath School disaster, oh, which made man. it the deadliest attack ever to occur in an American school. It's Still right. is. Richard Fritz, whose older sister Marjorie Fritz was killed in the explosion, was injured in the explosion and died almost one year later of myocarditis at the age of eight. Well, not linked to it. Although Richard is not included on many lists of victims, his death from myocarditis is thought to have been directly caused by an infection resulting from his injuries. So, 46 people then, huh? All right. Governor Green quickly called for donations to aid the townspeople and created the Bath Relief Fund with the money supplied by donors, the state, and local governments. People from around the country donated to the fund as well. Mm. School resumed on September 5th, 1927. And for the 1927-28 school year, they were held at the community hall, the township hall, and two retail buildings. Most of the surviving students returned. The board, all right, would you, would you return? Right, I would, don't think, I mean, I would Jeez. assume most of them that returned are upperclassmen that were, right. you know. The board appointed O.M. Brandt of Luther, Michigan, to succeed Hike as superintendent. The Lansing architect, Warren Holmes, donated construction plans, and the school board approved the contracts for new building on 14th September. <laughs> he donated construction plans. He's like, I'll drop a plan for you for free. I ain't building the shit, though. <laughs> you, you have to fork out some money for that. Yeah. Hey, check out this picture. I'm going to donate this picture of a new school. Here, oh, jeez. Yeah. September 15th. <laughs> figure, out make <laughs> figure out how to get yeah. it built. September 15th, Michigan U.S. Senator James J. Cousins presented his personal check for seventy five thousand. Damn! Uh, man, look at him. Holy shit! Equivalent to one point one million dollars. Look at this the guy. Bath construction he fund should to be help the build next the governor. School. Should be named James J. Cousins School. Ain't if anything, change name to Cousins. Holy shit! Where going to Cousins, Michigan? What baby. the hell did this guy do? Oh, uh, that's why. Why? He's part of Ford. Oh, dude had money, dude. Money. He took over the business management of the new firm, which was. Uh, he was secretary of Ford Motor Company when it was founded in 1903. Dude had fucking money. The board demolished the damaged portion of the school and constructed a new wing with the donated funds. Oh, so they rebuilt on the school. Oh, they should. During That's the so reconstruction, good. dynamite was found in the building on three separate occasions. Oh, Jeez. No. The James Cousins Agricultural School was dedicated, oh, at least they named it after him, on August 18, 1928. The Keyhole Farm was completely plowed to ensure that no explosives were hidden in the ground and was sold at auction to pay the mortgage. Wow. Wonder who lives there now on that site, huh? I bet it's just a field. I bet it's not. All right. Artist Carlton W. Angel presented the board with a memorial statue in 1928 entitled Girl with a Cat, also known as Girl with a Kitten. The Bath School Museum in the school district's middle school contains many items connected to the disaster, including the statue. 1975, the Cousins. Why would they have. Wait. 
Why would they have a memorial to the deadliest uh, massacre in school history inside of a middle school so students are, like, passing by that shit in the hallways? I mean, it's it's kind of weird, dude. That the middle school, it got built right back on the site, so why not? That's where the memorial needs to be. I mean, I guess, but especially nowadays with all these school shootings, like, these kids kids, are probably probably terrified. The kids would need to see that, because then when they walk past it, they're going to be like, I'm never safe. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Always keep your guard up, boys. You're never safe. You're never safe. Oh, I'm sure it's well talked about around there. 1975, the Cousins building was demolished. Oh, see? Yep. Site was redeveloped as the James Cousins Memorial Park, dedicated to the victims. At the center of the park is the Bath Consolidated School's original cupola, which is a dome. Which is like the dome part. Which um, survived the, the disaster yeah. and remained on the school until the building was torn down. Well, they should have survived that, too, and put it on a new school. Right. Idiots. After some debate, a Michigan State historical marker was installed at the, by some debate right. at the park in 1991 by the Michigan Historical Commission. 2002, a bronze plaque bearing the names of those killed in the disaster was placed on a large stone near the entrance of the park. Why would anybody disagree with that? Right. The town announced on November 3rd, 2008, that tombstones had been donated for Emily and Robert Bromont. The last two bombing victims whose graves were still unmarked. Oh, that mm. sucks. Grant from a foundation paid for the grave markers. Good for them. All right. September 2014. Right. Uh, two, uh, yes. uh, September 2014, a gravestone was installed at the grave of Richard A. Fritz, whose death in 1928 was attributed to his injuries sustained in the explosion. The gravestone was paid for by an author writing about the uh, disaster for a book. Whoops. Wow. Wow. I just hit the mic. I just hit the mic. Yeah. A documentary on the disaster was released in 2011. Including interviews with various survivors, which had been taped starting in 2004. May 18th, 2017. Where can I find that? That's <clears> interesting. <throat> right. May 18th, 2017, the disaster's 90th anniversary was marked with a panel discussion at the Bath Middle School. 1st of May, 2022, weeks short of the disaster's 95th anniversary. Irene Dunham, the last Bath School student from the time of the disaster, died at the age of 114. Jeez, dude. So in 95, she was nine years old when that happened. Dude. She was the one to be there to tell everybody for years and years about what happened. She was nine years old. Wow. Which means she was in the section where it blew up. Right. It's crazy. Wow. To be 114, dude. 114, dude. Did that for a reason. I bet you she did nothing but talks about. I guarantee oh, that I, her life was talking about that. Oh. Medical experts have seen the unique act of historic school terrorism as a way to gain perspective on pediatric patterns of injury and future disaster preparedness. Is it what they previewed it on? Right. Mm. Get the hell out of here. Well, now it's time for the messed up part. Your names? <clears throat> List of those killed in the disaster. Obviously, before the school bombing, Nellie Kehoe, which was the wife, and killed in the school, we had Arnold V. Bowerly, age 8, third grade, Henry Bargan, age 14, sixth grade, Herman Bergen, same oh same brothers. brothers yeah age eleven fourth grade Emily Bromont age eleven fifth grade Robert Bromont mm. age twelve fifth grade Floyd E Burnett age twelve sixth grade Russell J Chapman age eight fourth grade F Robert Cochran age eight third grade Ralph A Cushman age seven third grade Earl E Ewing age eleven sixth grade Catherine O Foot age ten sixth grade Marjorie Fritz age nine fourth grade. Oh. Jeez, Fritz, Fritz, too, yeah. Jeez. Carlisle W. Geisenhaver, age nine, fourth grade, German. <laughs> mm-hmm. George P. Hall, Jr., age eight, third grade. Willa M. Hall, age 11, fifth oh, grade. Oh, jeez, the hearts. Look at these hearts. Well, this is the one that the mother was had the two girls beside her and uh, holding the boy. Iola I. Hart, age 12, sixth grade. Percy E. Hart, age 11, third grade. Jeez. Vivian O. Hart, age 8, third grade. That's three members of the Hart family. Now we got a different Hart family that Dude. ends with an E. Wow. Blanche E. Hart, age 30. She was a teacher. Oh, geez. So her kids weren't there? Galen L. Hart, age 12, sixth grade. Lavere R. Hart, age 9, fourth grade. Stanley H. Hart, Think about age it. 12, sixth grade. Francis O. Hopner, age 13, sixth grade. Cecil L. Hunter, age 13, sixth grade. Doris E. Johns, age 8, 3rd grade. Thelma I. McDonald, age 8, 3rd grade. Clarence W. McFerrin, age 13, 6th grade. J. Emerson Medkoff, age 8, 4th grade. Emma A. Nichols, age 13, 6th grade. Richard D. Richardson, age 12, 6th grade. L. C. M. Robb, age 12, 6th grade. Pauline M. Schertz, age 10, 5th grade. 
Hazel I. Weatherby, age 20, as a teacher. Oh, no. Elizabeth J. Witchell. Hazel. I missed the name, Hazel. That's a good name. Elizabeth J. Witchell, age 10, fifth grade. Lucille J. Witchell, age 9, fifth grade. Little uh, sisters there, huh? Harold L. Woodman, age 8, third grade. George O. Zimmerman, age 10, third grade. Lloyd Zimmerman, age 12, fifth grade. And uh, killed by the truck bombing. G. Cleo Clayton, age 8, second grade. Emery E. Hike. Age 33, superintendent. Nelson McFerrin, age 74, retired farmer. Glenn O. Smith, age 33, was the postmaster and later died of injuries. Wow. Beatrice P. Gibbs, age 10, fourth grade. Jeez, old Pete, dude. That's just ridiculous. That took too long what it should have. It shouldn't have been no names. Yeah. One name. What did they say? One name is too, too much. Too many. Right, get down here. Highest was sixth grade. Lowest was third grade. <sighs> That's just stupid. No, lowest was... Uh, that's a stupidity. And th- this guy. Lois was second grade. This guy, what he was thinking, he was like, there's no, the only way I can hurt these people is to take out. Get their attention, take out the right. children. Yeah, they're, they're, they're weakest link. They're, you know, the weakest of them. You take out the children. And how many of these. Wow, what a dick. How many of these people that were on the board with them and. Um, Dude. The, like the, the, the. The county clerks and all that stuff that he was. How many of these people's kids? Maybe that was right. the reason. All these adults that that he disliked because of they hated oh, of him yeah, for the this stuff. Bad. Dude, they were all these. Town. There's all these people's kids. Yeah, it's dude. a small town. I guarantee if we find some of these names, they'll be on the boards and senators or the the secretary of treasury or whatever. Yeah. Uh but imagine if both bombs wouldn't went off. You're talking 200, well, 200 dead. Here we go. Nelson McFerrin. We didn't even make that uh, connection. The retired farmer that got killed when hike or uh, when uh, he detonated his truck. He, oh. I'm assuming, is his child, Clarence W. McFerrin, right. age 13, sixth grade. So clearly, his child. <sighs> right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So there's what more was to the that. superintendent's name? Hike. There was no hikes. No. He didn't have no kids. He but had no kids. Yeah, crazy stuff, dude. Uh, that's uh, that's rough. That's gonna do it for us and this episode of Outlaws and Gunslingers with another heavy. I know we joked around in the in the earlier part of this uh, um, show, but you know what? We joke around whenever. You know, if you can't handle that, when it gets real, it gets real. And yeah. obviously, a messed up situation, deadliest massacre in school history, and one of the deadliest massacres in, in American history. Terrible. Period. It's rough. But as heavy as the subjects can be sometimes, that's what we got to do on here, uh, Outlaws and Gunslinger. You, so. can't, uh, you can't bubble wrap history, man. Right. You can't do it. You can't do it. You just got to tell how it is. I mean, it, it happened. Tell how it happened. Um, anyways, uh, um, I think next week we'll lighten it up a little bit with uh, um, a guy named... Frank Baglone, <laughs> Baglone. who uh, he was a Baglone. fraudster and a check fraud scam oh. guy. Um, there was a movie made about him, Catch Me If You Can, with Leo DiCaprio playing his oh, role. You might have that, uh, that, seen that it. Guy? Yeah, look at that. Um, That's interesting. We'll probably be back, but a little light, a little lighthearted. Nobody gets killed. <laughs> is that Tom Hanks is trying to catch Tom him? Tom Hanks yeah, is trying to catch yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, Nobody yeah. gets killed in that uh, thing. So this will be back for next week. No, and there is no deaths, is there? Right. Nope, we'll soon be converging on our mafia stuff. So we got a question for you guys, which hit us up on Twitter at up? OGMM Podcast or boop, boop. email us at uh, bang dang podcast bang dang. at gmail.com. Let us know how you want us to proceed with the mafia um, no. stuff. Do you want us to do person by person, like how we've been doing with all this stuff, like in the in the um old west, person by person, like Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, or I probably pronounced the name wrong. Trust me, we'll, we'll have a lot of that coming up with the mafia. Definitely. But person by person, or do you want us just to do just families like the um, oh. the Colombo or yeah. the um, oh. family, just by family oh. by family? Or oh, the, we can do it family by family, but when we break it down. Right. So you guys let us know. Either by email or hit there's, us up on Twitter. There's so much. We're not going to just fly through Mafia. We're, Let we're, a, I'm, I'm we're, letting them decide. Shut we, up. No, we're breaking this down from every every letter. I'm letting you guys decide how you want us to no. do it. You want us to do it we're by gonna break down to the person by arms. person or just do the families. No. Um, 
Because to would be you honest, just with, do the family. To be honest with you, if we do person by person, a lot of the stories are going to be the same. They're not going to be. The they same. are going to be the same because yeah. a lot of the uh, big guys are involved in the same shit. We're going to have the repeat stories a hundred times. No, it'll yes, be different. Only thing to be different is the life story on. Um, right. Um, right. John Gotti, his life story, but we'll still have the same so murder what? and all this stuff so and six. Thir- 13 different episodes so on the what? same fam- family. So it's what? not up to you. First of all, it's up to the viewer. It's, Number one, mm. you guys email us You're or right. go to you Twitter. Said, said Some of you guys email us, bangdangpodcast at gmail.com or hit us up on Twitter, OGMM Podcast. Let us know how you prefer us to cover the mafia. We got about a couple more weeks before that happens, but we need to get prepared because we got an epic six month, at least long journey on the mafia. So Ooh, we need to hear your guys' wee. feedback and opinions on how you want us to uh, go about that. And other we're about, to hear the, we're about to hear the word whack a lot. <laughs> I don't think they say it at all. Uh, and we're other gonna say it. We're gonna say it. <laughs> in other American history, we do another podcast. Mm. We do another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> we do another podcast called Battles of the American Civil War, whereas the title suggests right. we take a look at all of the bad one. Well, the title doesn't suggest we do all the battles, but we do do all the battles. Uh, I said do do. We do all the battles of I mean, the does suggest it. American it Battles of the American Civil, Civil War, War from the first so, one, Fort Sumter, all the way to the end. We are currently that is skir- skirmishes, uh, pass everything by. in between. Even if they just pass each other by and they talk shit. To each right, other. we got that. We got the world war. We, we got, got that for you. America's first rat battles. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got. Uh, we're about two months into 1862. Hey. We just finished up Fort Donaldson. Uh, shit's getting real, boys. Which was the first major victory for the Union in the whole war. Shit's getting real. Uh, class A battle, and then we got coming up uh, a couple B's, couple A battles, and then we went from saying. Uh, 50 to 60 to hundreds dead to saying thousands dead right um, instantly and now yeah. we're about to say hundreds of thousands we got the battle of the second battle or of tens of thousands that's what i meant <clears throat> tens of thousands dude well i'm not talking about a massacre right we got the second battle of bull run coming up down the turnpike a bunch of stuff going on over at the american civil war we're only in 1862 just really getting started that's battles of the american civil war wherever you get your podcast we'll be back next week for a lowly criminal who like to uh, impersonate as a pilot and other stupid things to right. fraudulently pass checks, which is a, a big move away from the last four or five episodes we've been yeah, doing hell here. Yeah, hell of a name, but too. Hell of a name. All of our episodes can't be moida. Right. And disaster. Disaster. We'll be back next week for that. We are the Mouth of Michiganders with... Bang, dang. <laughs>